welcome uh, Professor Ian Broom. Well, thanks, Sam, and thanks for the invitation to this. Uh, all I can say is quite an amazing conference. And I've never been at a conference where the audience has been so enthusiastic. It's unbelievable. I mean, it's really great. Like, I really can't thank Sam, but also the audience as well for their active participation. It's really, really good. Now, I've entitled this Fake News, um, and it's about the only thing I can say is come out of Donald Trump that's actually good, and that's the <laughs> phrase fake news. I hope there are no Donald Trump supporters around, but I did give him the benefit of the doubt in the beginning, but I'm a bit worried about what's going on now. A little bit about my background in relation to low carbohydrate approaches. I actually am a, uh, a biochemist by training and a physician by adoption. Um, and indeed, I had really quite strange training because I was a physician uh, working as a lecturer in surgery and then senior lecturer in surgery. So I worked with the surgeons. And Tim put up a paper this morning with two names on it that I recognised, Bruce Bistrian and George Blackburn. They are responsible for my getting involved in low-carbohydrate diets, not in relation to diabetes or obesity, but in relation to problems occurring after surgery where surgical patients might develop sepsis. And we use a post-operative ketogenic approach to monitor for sepsis in patients who were deemed to be at risk of their junction of whatever they've put together breaking down and causing sepsis. So that was my introduction into that. And the reason I got to know George and Bruce is that Aberdeen University has a a joint uh, program with them within the Department of Surgery to transfer junior staff across for a period of a year. So that's how I got to know this. George is also involved in bariatric surgery, or was, and uh, one of our fellows went across there and came back and started bariatric surgery in Aberdeen in 1982, long before bariatric surgery was done anywhere else in the UK, with the exception of Wales. So, Prior to having patients ready for bariatric surgery, usually their livers are pretty large and they get in the way of the surgery. So you have to have a way of reducing the liver size. And we do this by simply putting them onto a low-carb ketogenic diet for two weeks before surgery. Now, most of these patients' BMI was well above 40 and they had been totally unsuccessful in reducing their weight. But when they went onto this diet, they were amazed that the weight just appeared to drop off and a lot of these patients actually refused surgery. And that's how my obesity clinic started. Um, that was that, which ended up being huge, if you'll pardon the pun. Uh, in addition, I always had an interest in diabetes, and specifically in obese type 2 di uh, diabetes. So I, apart from working in surgery, I also worked in the diabetic clinic. And, Consequently, because of my interest, I got all the complicated type 2 diabetics referred to me. And I thought, why are we feeding these patients carbohydrate when their main problem is carbohydrate intolerance? Why don't, we, why don't they use this ketotic approach? And it made a huge difference, as you'll see later. So anyway, enough of my background. I better go on to what really is 40 years of really good diabetes and associated CVD management and prevention through a low-fat carbohydrate dietary advice. That is the fake news. That is absolute rubbish. Right. Now, the low-fat, high-carbohydrate diets were originally proposed to reduce coronary heart disease, mortality and prevention of coronary heart disease. And cholesterol was the primary target. And low-fat, high-carbohydrate diets were not designed to deal with either weight or diabetes management. Not at all. Now, again, everyone talks about randomized controlled clinical trials. These were designed specifically for drug therapy assessment, where there is only one variable, the drug or a placebo. There's actually a very poor structure to look at uh, dietary studies, because there is always more than one variable. If you change one macronutrient, you alter the other macronutrients. You can't take account of patient's preference, you can't take account of peer pressure. There are lots of variables that impact 
on an RCT becoming appropriate. And because of problems relating to patients and their peer group, the dropout rate from RCTs in dietary studies is huge. If you had the same dropout rate in drug studies, the drug, uh, the whole study would be dropped, it would be just cancelled out because it is seen not to be appropriate since 30% or more of patients can't tolerate the drug. So we have a, we've got a patient acceptability problem in terms of uh, adherence to specific dietary <coughs> therapy. And diet and disease is very complex. It's not a simple issue. Unfortunately, most of our medical graduates since the last World War have had very little uh, training in nutrition. Prior to the Second World War, there was a huge amount of nutrition in the training. And Hippocrates said, if you don't understand the food that man is eating, you will never, never understand the diseases that will affect him. So it, it's, I think we've lost the way in terms of our medical training with nutrition. We do not get sufficient training in nutrition. Right, low carbohydrate diets, weight loss or metabolic control. Low carbohydrate diets are important. Yes, they will cause weight loss, but they're much more important because the, imp the improvement in metabolic control is completely independent of weight loss. You get improved insulin sensitivity because of the removal of ectopic fat. This was discussed yesterday with the various MRI pictures. Uh, low fat diets, I've said that, low carbohydrate diet gives us an imp improved control independent of weight loss. Bariatric surgery, again, clearly demonstrated an independence between weight loss and improved control. Patients achieving bariatric, who have had bariatric surgery, their diabetic control or their metabolic control improves within the first 10 days, long before they've actually lost any weight. Now, this is probably, this is history, and you probably know all about this. Ansel Keys is the main protagonist for this, and he was a very good physiologist, nutritionist. Um, he'd probably done the best study of starvation ever published in two volumes in the 1950s. He couldn't do it now what he did then because he would never get ethical permission to do it. But basically he was determined that fat was the problem in relation to coronary heart disease. He started off initially with total fat and then wound that back to saturated fat. Now he had a number of countries he could look at but it didn't match his hypothesis. So he, cho he chose seven countries to prove his hypothesis. And he ignored all the data that was there on sugar. Now, in the 1970s, when this new dietary change came about, I was actually in touch with uh, Professor Ahrens at the Rockefeller. And he was strongly against this, absolutely. And he said, if you go down this route, Ansel, you will end up with an epidemic of obesity and type 2 diabetes. And that's what he said in 1977, before the guidelines came out. He was ignored. And you heard about John Yudkin, he said exactly the same thing. And John was pilloried by Ansel Keys. Uh, the Finnish dietary study was a very complex, this is the North Karelia project, was a very complex program. And there was a lot more factors altered than simple dietary fat. And again, coronary heart disease was the target illness. And cholesterol was what was being targeted. And this was thought to be, if you reduce saturated fat, this would have that effect, and increase unsaturated fat, you would get a beneficial effect. I'm not sure what the weight of the Finnish population is at the moment, but I'm sure it's higher than it was in 1983. The evidence against the 22 country studies, which Ansel Keys had the data for and could have used, he didn't use. What did the 22 country studies show? No evidence of fat being associated with coronary heart disease. Refined carbohydrate consumption and tobacco were suggested as linked factors for the, the 22 country study. The Nurses' Health Study, no effect of dietary fat and cardiovascular disease. The Women's Health Initiative, um, 49,000 premenopausal women. Fat reduction was affected. Saturated fat was affected. No effect 
on cardiovascular disease. 2008, um, FAO review, no convincing evidence for fat. 2012 Cochrane review, 24 studies, no effect on CVD or total mortality by reducing fat intake. Low-fat diets are geared to coronary heart disease and cholesterol. High-carbohydrate diets lead to inappropriate increased insulin levels and to drive adipose tissue <laughs> fat synthesis. And again, this type of diet also drives nutri nutrient partitioning. If you are insulin resistant, and that frequently, that affects roughly 40% of the Caucasian population, um, believe it or not, if you're insulin resistant, yes, the muscles are resistant to the effects of insulin. The insulin still binds to the muscle membrane. It's the intracellular signal that causes the problem. If you look at the effect of insulin on adipose tissue, there is not so much insulin resistance. So therefore, if you drive high carbohydrate, you drive fat synthesis and you drive weight up. And in patients with the appropriate genetic disposition, you will drive up ectopic fat and make insulin resistance worse and eventually end up with type 2 diabetes. Now, you've seen these things before. This is uh, intrahepatic fat, and this is subcutaneous fat. These two patients have the same BMI, the same waist circumference. Look at the blood pressure differences. Cholesterol, there is a difference, but the main difference is actually in the HDL and the triglycerides. What a high carbohydrate diet does is to drive uh, HDL down and drive triglycerides up. Now, I, I know you may not believe in cholesterol, but cholesterol does have an effect, and especially when the LDL cholesterol is in a specific form. And when the values are here, it is in a specific form, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Obesity still is the primary risk factor for type 2 diabetes. Um, as you go up the BMI scale, the risk of developing type 2 diabetes increases. Interestingly enough, once you go above 40, um, which is a, a much smaller um, proportion of the obese population, that's, that link is not quite so strong. And then likewise in women, but again, it's, it's twice as dangerous in women than it is in men in terms of the likelihood of developing type 2 diabetes. And as was mentioned earlier, we have a big problem in terms of the numbers of patients that are proposed to be becoming type 2 diabetes. It's big enough in the developed world, but in the developing world, it is huge. And this was, again, talked about this morning in relation to Africa, but it relates to all industrializing countries. It's a huge problem that we need to try and sort out. And we can sort it out by changing the dietary guidelines. Now, alterations to macronutrient dietary composition, you're talking about high and low fat, high and low carbohydrate, standard and high protein, VLCDs, LCDs, or combinations of these. But the real debate is all about moving to a low carbohydrate diet. That is, where, that is what we're trying to do. That's the outcome they really want. Now, this uh, is a diet that I used in the obesity clinic to try and get patients to bring their weight down. It was adapted somewhat for um, type 2 diabetics. It took me a long time in NHS Grampian to persuade my dietetic colleagues that this was a good approach to managing both obesity and type 2 diabetes. I won, however, because NHS Grampian at one point, one time, was the only NHS authority within the UK to issue a low carbohydrate leaflet to patients to allow them to maintain this program and the dietitians themselves would support it. I changed my diabetic clinic dietitians approach to managing type 2 diabetes and their use of low carbohydrate diets. I made, I think, a big impact on the junior staff coming through the clinic because they could see how this was working. And I know that some of them who are now consultants are using this approach in their own clinics albeit north of the border. But effectively, we have, I tended to use a higher protein, 120 grams a day, 
giving 41% energy, um, carbohydrate maximum of 40 grams a day, 16% energy, and the fat was 43 grams, 43% energy. Now, at, this, at the same time, the standard amount of fat in standard healthy eating suggested by Diabetes UK uh, with the 600 calorie deficit diet, and it was actually giving 51 to 59 grams of fat. So we, this is actually a low-fat diet, despite the fact it's a low-carbohydrate diet. So I'm perfectly in keeping with the Diabetes UK's uh, situation at that time, except um, I'm using a lot more of the total energy as fat. Now, patient acceptability, I said, is very important. And it has been stated that patients will not accept a low-carbohydrate diet. Again, all the evidence is totally against this. These are various randomized controlled trials, despite what I said about randomized controlled trials, where these are the dropout rates, right? So the low carbohydrate, much higher, much higher, much higher, much higher, all at highly significant levels. So there is a complete <coughs> fallacy that patients will not tolerate a low carbohydrate approach. They tolerate it much better than a low fat approach. And low fat means obviously high sugar. Um, palatability in terms of a diet is very important. If you reduce the fat in the diet to very low levels, it becomes completely unpalatable. And the only way to get it palatable is to add sugar. And that's what the food industry does. It adds sugar, it adds preservatives. The preservatives themselves have effects on, on dietary intake, effects on appetite, effects on satiety. The food industry know about this, they won't tell you. I've not been sued yet um, for saying it. I've said it several times. Now, again, this is what you might expect in a typical uncontrolled, poorly controlled uh, type 2 diabetic. Hemoglobin A1c, 10%. The patient had a BMI of 40. Um, he was a trawler skipper. Couldn't obviously go on, uh, as a trawler uh, out on the ship. Um, he was on 400 units of insulin per day. He had severe angina. The cardiac surgeons wouldn't look at him in terms of doing a bypass. Um, he was referred to me by the cardiac surgeons. I put him on a low carbohydrate diet. And you can see within three weeks, he dropped his hemoglobin A1C from 10% to 8.5%, and it continued to drop. Um, a year after this, he had his coronary artery bypass graft, and 10 years later, he was still very much alive and kicking. His weight had gone up slightly, but he was still maintaining his low carbohydrate intake. And there was also an extra benefit for me, because he was a trawler skipper, so therefore every couple of weeks or so, I got a huge portion of fish on my desk at the clinic um, for several years, in fact, until I retired. Again, it doesn't matter. In terms of weight loss, with the exception of one year, there is always a much greater benefit of low-carbohydrate approaches to low-fat approaches in terms of actual weight loss. Uh, at three months, at six months. Now, the problem is that at, at six months, most dietary therapies tend to fail. We don't really know why they tend to fail that patients tend to come off their diet at six months. And that's why they fail. But why do the patients come off at six months? That we don't know and don't understand. Which really e explains why at six months, oops, six months is the usual maximum. Now, the other thing about uh, the, the weight loss is that you get much better weight loss and, much, and it's very consistent. This is my, Aileen Robertson's was my, uh, dietitian in the diabetic clinic here, and you can see we get really quite much better weight loss than you would expect. Uh, you're looking at 5%, this is um, 8%, roughly 9%. Foster, again, very similar results. And Samaha, again, similar results. And if you a systematic review, which one of my students carried out many years ago, um, clearly demonstrated an improvement with the low carbohydrate in virtually all studies at six months. It wasn't quite so clear, and there are fewer, fewer studies at this particular time at, at one year. So there are perhaps problems with um, this sustainability. But then I think the sustainability requires 
apart from the change in diet, a behaviour modification programme along with the diet. Now, the other thing that is always said is that once you have diabetes, it is much more difficult to lose weight. Of course it is. If you use a high carbohydrate diet, you're pushing fat deposition. So that's why it's more difficult. They have a huge problem with insulin resistance. And this, this is Wing's study where she used type 2 diabetics uh, and non-diabetic spouses. And the weight loss that they achieved in exactly the same environment, exactly the same food, the, di the diabetics lost exactly half of what the non-diabetics did. Right? And this has always been a problem. No matter what you actually, how you look at managing obesity, if you look at the, the, uh, the Rio studies, and the Rio diabetes study, you've got the diabetes placebo, the diabetes remonabant, you've got a good difference. Then you've got the non-diabetes placebo. Again, the weight loss in the placebo group the non-diabetics is twice as much as the diabetics. Why? Because the dietary advice that was given to these patients was a 600 calorie deficit diet based on high carbohydrate. What happens if you go on to a low carbohydrate diet? Now this is a bit extreme because this is a VLCD. And you can see there is absolutely no difference in the rate of weight loss between diabetics and non-diabetics. These patients were all on a ketogenic diet. They had maximum of 50 grams of carbohydrate input, and they lost weight at exactly the same rate. Again, if you look at all the drug trials in the placebo group, um, weight changes in type 2 diabetes, minus 2.4 at 6 months, 2.6 at 12 months. 12 month weight change uh, in the various drug trials, 4.6 to 7.6, so roughly you get an expected 40% weight loss in the diabetics in the drug trials. If you look at the actual drug itself, orally stat, uh, with diabetes, just under 5. Non-diabetics, well over 8, 62%. Sibutamine, which works slightly differently, uh, there is, you can get a better effect in the diabetics than you do uh, with the other drugs. Um, it's up at 87 90%. If you lose a low carbohydrate diet in type 2 diabetics, you get 7 kilograms weight loss, 7.6 kilograms a year, and without, it's 100%. VLCDs, 19 kilograms, 100%. So if you drop the carbohydrate con uh, content, you will get diabetics to lose weight at exactly the same rate as non-diabetics. But as I said before, you'll get improved glycemic control improved metabolic control even before this weight loss occurs because the insulin levels are immediately dropped and this has an immediate change on other factors. Let's get one thing straight. Insulin is an atherogenic hormone. If you have high insulin levels, you will develop ather atherosclerosis. And all type 2 diabetic patients at the moment die from cardiovascular disease complications effectively. Now, if you look at the lipid abnormalities in diabetics versus non-diabetics, there's absolutely no difference in total cholesterol between diabetics and non-diabetics. There is no difference in LDL cholesterol between diabetics and non-diabetics. The difference is in the HDL cholesterol, which is reduced, and the triacylglycerol, which is raised. High carbohydrate diets push the excess glucose into triglycerides and they go up. As that goes up, there's a, a concomitant problem in terms of HDL, and HDL actually goes down. And this creates what is called an atherogenic profile. And it relates to, effectively, the, the LDL size. But if you look at, again, low carbohydrates, low fat, 39% of the population were type 2 diabetic, 43% had metabolic syndrome, weight loss at six months, in the low carbohydrate, 5.8 kilograms, much less in the low fat. Plasma triacylglycerol reduction, 20%. Nope. Insulin sensitivity, vastly improved. What happens with the, with the low fat, high carbohydrate? It gets worse. The insulin resistance gets worse. Now, this is a little schematic that uh, 
if you consider these as LDL particles, right, where you have a nice high HDL cholesterol and a, a low triglyceride, you've got big, large, happy-go-lucky, smiling particles that really ignore the, the arterial wall. On the other hand, if you feed these individuals a high-carbohydrate diet and they're insulin-resistant, metabolic syndrome, or type 2 diabetic, you change the size of the LDL particle. The same concentration of LDL is still there, but you've got 10 times as many particles, and they're also very aggressive. They do not like the arterial uh, cell wall, and they attack it. They get easily oxidized, and they become inflammatory processes. And this is what sets up the problems with atheroma in all of the major vessels. And again, if you have this insulin resistance problem, as David pointed out uh, yesterday, um, insulin acts as, uh, on the kidneys to reabsorb sodium, and this will lead to effectively hypertension. Right. So you can see it doesn't take very long to actually <laughs> change the, the particle size. Right? Pa pattern A is what we actually want, big, fat, happy-go-lucky LDL particles. Pattern B is what we don't want. But even in pattern A, you, you get an increase in the LDL particle size. And in pattern B, within three weeks, you're actually above the level where these particles might, become, might be more atherogenic. And certainly that is, that is also, that is also uh, main, maintained at, at week six. Right. Now, what about dietary carbohydrate effects on blood pressure? The only heart study, APON 2005, 44% or 54% of energy is carbohydrate. The same total energy. Now, this is not a huge reduction in carbohydrate. It's a small reduction. But the BP reduced on the 44% carbohydrate diet. Absolutely no change on the 54% carbohydrate diet. So even a small reduction in carbohydrate will lead to improvement in, in, in blood pressure. All this data so far has at least um, attempted one group of clinicians to change their country's guidelines or to try and change their country's guidelines. I don't think they're quite changed yet. Brazil's have changed. Brazil has gone down to a lower carbohydrate intake. But basically, in 2013, the Scandinavian Health Eating recommendations were to re reduce carbohydrate intake, increase protein, increase fat, and that dairy produce was healthy. That's their new recommendations. As I say, I'm not sure that they've been implemented by the Swedish government, but Brazil certainly has. Right, what basically are the outcomes in terms of low fat? And I think the best thing is what Richard Smith said in an editorial in the BMJ, is that the successful attempt to reduce fat in the diet worldwide has been an uncontrolled global experiment with absolutely disastrous results. Mm -hmm. And this has led to what Aaron pro uh, uh, projected, an epidemic of obesity worldwide, an epidemic of type 2 diabetes worldwide. And it starts, unfortunately, in our children. It's in it, our, our children that are really going to take the brunt of this. And if the government is worrying about being able to afford pensions in the future, it needn't worry because they're at, our children, or our grand, my grandchildren, might die at a younger age than me because of this stupid um, arrangement by the advisors to govern this government and the government in the West to adopt a high carbohydrate intake. It's an absolute and utter disgrace. <laughs> now, I think I'll, I'll finish up with just evolution, right? We used to be like this when we were hunter-gatherers, the Paleolithic diet, and we used to worship this. And if you look, there are lots of these stone carvings around. And now we are this, and we are worshipping that. I mean, yeah. thank you very much.